Well, again, it is so good to be in worship with you. Can I just say again, you are my church family. And so it's a privilege to be with you right now, right here, today, once again. Can I say to those of you that are watching online, you are my church family too. And I know there are a lot of different reasons why you're not in person, but you are part of this congregation. And I'm so glad you are a part of my worshiping experience today. So God bless you and uh, look forward to seeing you soon. Um, If you notice that the title of the sermon today, I want you to put the title of the sermon up there. You might be thinking the preacher's finger got stuck on the W key just a couple of times too long because everybody knows if you're going to put out a website, you put three W's dot name of the site and what have you. Everybody knows that. Well, for the next several weeks, not just three, actually six. Hmm, you're going, oh, six. Okay. Anyway. Uh, We're going to be talking about mission and purpose right here at Florence United Methodist Church. Um, I want want to say quickly, nothing revolutionary, nothing like that you've never heard before. We aren't necessarily trying to chart new territory. I just want to be clear and say again that we are aware of, of why we are here, why Florence Church is here, and we are determined to be about the mission that the Lord Jesus has given to us. And this is kind of a step back, not to, not to build or whatever, no, not, but to refocus, to refocus so that we can better, better move forward. So it's going <clears> to, <throat> we're going to be spending some time, step back, step forward, step back, step forward over the next several weeks. And uh, today, to begin with, I want to go back to uh, the, the psalm that Pastor Anna referenced when she was with the kids For the purpose of worship as the first of the purposes, I want us to set the stage with Psalm 95, verses 1 through 7. So I'll invite you to stand as you're able, and let's uh, hear read again Psalm 95. Portions already today, but hear again. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In His hand are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountains are His also. The sea is His, for He made it, and the dry land which His hands have formed. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. For He is our God, and we are the people of His pasture, and the sheep of his hand. Oh, that today you would listen to his voice. Friends, this is God's word for us today, and our response is, thanks be to God. Please be seated. I'm praying for God to speak to me during these next six weeks. To us, yes, definitely, but to me over these next weeks in a fresh, in a new way, uh, about being the church in the world, and being the church all the way to Boone County, to Florence. I live in Burlington, Union, Walton, wherever we happen to land, that we would be the church right there in the year 2022. You, you heard me say before, my goal as we are coming back from the pandemic is never going to be, let's see how fast we can get to 2019. Mm-mm, not going there. Come with an open heart. Come with an open mind. And I want to invite you to participate in these sermons with me by by texting me, Facebook messaging me, send me an email to share your ideas because I'm hoping there'll be some juices uh, churning in your heads and hearts as well. So you be sure and share some of that with me. I would love for this to just turn into a dialogue, but quite honestly, that's not real practical, that we can't just do that. And so, but if you have a thought and you want a a response to that thought, send it to me, and I promise I will respond. So now that I've just booked my life away, uh, let's get started. Let's get started. And I want to start with worship as the first topic, worship as the first topic. And it's not just first, first just because. No, no, no. It is first because if there is not worship... Uh, the other things that we'll talk about won't, won't really matter. 
Hebrews chapter 10 says, don't, don't be like some who have stopped gathering together. He's saying, no, 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 you get together. And let me back up again. Persons online, you're part of this. You're part of this. Yes, you are. So worship is our first topic. Every church is unique, is unique in its worship. Much like every one of us have fingers with fingerprints and every one of them is unique. Now, I was doing some reading and researching and there are over 380,000 churches just in the United States. Now, out of our borders across the world, thousands, thousands, thousands more. And each one of those is just a little bit different. If we look at all of our fingerprints under a magnifying glass, you know, all of our fingerprints have some similarities, but we would also very quickly see how uniquely different they are. Maybe not obvious to you and to me, but very definitely to a forensic investigator. So we're going to be doing some investigating into the life of our church. And I want to say from the onset of this little six-week journey we're going to take, that the goal of speaking of the mission of Florence Church is not for Florence Church to become a clone of some famous church out in California or up in Chicago or over in Louisville or Lexington or even in our little backyard of Florence. We need to be asking, what does God want us to be? What does God want us to be? What is our fingerprint? Because I believe someone ought to be able to walk into this service, the 9 o'clock service, and over the course of a couple of weeks, be able to get their hand on the, the pulse of, of who we are, what we think is important, what is, why we think we are here, and, and see the fingerprint of this church. You know and I know that the idea of worshiping God is, is a very, very biblical idea. I, I just chose one text today, Psalm 95. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our God, our Maker. This is found all through the scriptures, whether it is building an altar out in the desert somewhere or whether it is building a temple in a city named Jerusalem somewhere. It's all through, all over the world right now, right now. Of course, different time zones all across the world. We know that's true. But right now, Sunday morning, all around the world, people are worshiping. Now, you tell me, are they all worshiping the same? <laughs> same way? Of course not. And I'm not just talking about language issues. No, no, no. I'm talking about selection of songs. I'm talking about the scriptures that they're focusing in on a given day, the way things are hap the way things are presented in the service. We use the word liturgy, the environments, the buildings. It's it's all different. I want to say something that may upset some of you, or you may be going, eh, I'm not so sure about that, but let me say it anyway. It is absolutely true that worship is biblical, but there is no such thing as biblical worship. Can I say that again? Worship is biblical, but there is no such thing as biblical worship. And, and by that I mean this. You've heard it. I've heard it. Maybe some of your friends have told you this. Oh, oh no, no, no. Our church is biblical. Hmm. And of course what they're saying without trying to be mean and just actually say it is, and we all know that yours is isn't. Hmm. You know, when biblical gets used as an excluding term, it is no longer being used correctly. Used that way, there's no such thing as biblical worship, as in, if you don't do it like this, then it really isn't biblical. But worship is biblical. So what is a biblical understanding of worship? I want to try and go there for at least a little while. You remember over in John chapter 4, Jesus and the disciples find themselves in Samaria. They find themselves at the well of Sychar, and Jesus finds himself in a conversation with a woman, as we call her, the woman at the well. Jesus is with her, and she says to Jesus, your people say you have to worship in Jerusalem, and my people say we're supposed to worship on this mountain. What does Jesus say to her? Jesus says, the day is coming when not on this mountain nor in Jerusalem, but those who truly worship will worship God in spirit and in truth, John chapter 4. 
So one good understanding of biblical worship is worshiping in spirit and in truth. And as long as we agree that my understanding is not necessarily the understanding, we're to worship in spirit and truth. But saying that means there is such a thing as truth, which means we need to use our minds. It's not just about our emotions, but also our spirits, our spirits. There must be something that moves inside of us. When I walk out of worship, I should sense something happened to me in there. Uh, that, that was good. It doesn't always matter whether I have learned something that I can tomorrow practically apply to my life. Sometimes it's enough to just simply say, it was good to be in the house of the Lord today. Come. Let's worship and bow down. Let's kneel before the Lord, our God, our maker. So using the idea that worship must be the first purpose of who we are, and we'll get to others over the next several weeks. But let me begin by saying our worship must be focused. Focused. Worship is a God thing. Hear me. Worship is not a me thing. Worship is not first about our self-expression. Worship is first of all about our self-surrender to Almighty God. Worship is not first of all about how you feel when you leave, although although I already said that is important. That's very important. But worship is to be first of all about God. Psalm 115 verse 1 says, Not to us, O Lord, but to thy name be glory. Not to us to thy name be glory. You know, when you walked in here this morning, were you tempted to think, no hands, no hands, don't show me. But were you tempted to think? And you may not even have verbalized it or processed it in your mind, but were you tempted perhaps to think, I wonder what they have to offer me today. I would suggest to us, and and you you know this is true, we should be walking into this place saying, God, What do I have to offer you today? Last week, three wise men. Mm. Of course, I had to laugh. Those three guys couldn't find their way around this sanctuary, much less across the desert. But anyway, they brought what they they brought themselves. I must walk in here as a as a giver today. What do I have to offer? Our worship must be focused on God. So when you leave, you can ask yourself the question. Uh, was God pleased with my worship today? Was God pleased with my worship today? Not did it feel good, not did it sound good, not was the music good, not was the preaching even half good, but was God pleased with my worship today? Our focus must be on God. A.W. Tozer, he's one of the Christian writers, been dead for a good while, but he's one of my favorites that has shaped my life many times over decades, says this, True worship seeks union with God and is an active effort to close the gap between the heart and the God that the heart adores. Was my worship today a time of closing the gap? Closing the gap? You know the picture. You're in a race. And some of you may go, (laughs) I'm not sure I remember that picture. But anyway, you're in a race and you're running and you're in the crowd and you see the guy there or the girl that's out there in the front. But you know, if as you're running, you're enjoying the trees and you're waving at the people and everything else, you are never going to close the gap between you and that person. Your eyes just have to be on the back of that person's head and you're closing in. Was our time of worship today a time of closing the gap? between the heart of God and our hearts. But you know, let me say, worship must also be intentional. Come, exclamation point, command. Come, let us worship. You know this. (laughs) Nobody stumbles into being holy. There is no such thing as an accidental saint. It's an intentional work of Almighty God and the intentional receiving of that work in the heart of, of us, the believers, You'll never just wake up one day and be holy. Worship is intentional. 
We're told in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, seek first the kingdom of God. Not along with all the other things, but first. Worship is a command in Scripture. Now, in the psalm next to the one we read, I just, again, said I just chose one of them. I chose Psalm 95. But in Psalm 96, verse 9, we read this. Worship the Lord in, and it's kind of a strange collection of words, holy array. Worship the Lord in holy array. What I believe that is saying is, you're not going to stumble into worship. In fact, don't even try to stumble into worship. Come here, can I say it? Come here on purpose. Come here on purpose. I get to go to worship today. I've made up my mind. My heart is set. Our worship must be intentional. But you know what? Our, our worship must also be relational. Relational. Worship is about closing the gap between our heart and God's heart. No question. Absolutely true. But very close to that is our relationship to one another. Psalm 122 verse 1 says, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. They, us into the house of the Lord. Worship is a we thing, a we thing. It's definitely not an us and them, definitely not an us versus them. It's not even a me thing. Worship must be a we thing. Let us go into the house of the Lord together. But you know, where it gets a little dicier and trickier is, it is also about our relationship with non-believers. One of the themes of the Old Testament is that the worship of Israel is supposed to draw the Gentiles unto salvation. Our worship must be about building relations, relationships with others. Oh, that the world would be drawn to Jesus just because they happened to visit us on a Sunday. And they saw these are lives that are or have been or are being changed even right now and different. But you know what? Our worship must also be sacrificial. Yeah, I had to get there. And, I, and I'm not talking about, you know, bring the lamb and cut the lamb and the blood on the altar. And I'm not talking about that. But I am talking about King David making this statement. I will not offer to God that which has cost me nothing. 2 Samuel 24. I will not offer to God that which has cost me nothing. What did it cost you? <laughs> what did it cost you to come here today? In China, that's a whole other world. But what did it cost you today? Well, obviously it cost time. It cost time. How about the cost of preparation? Maybe that's a Saturday night issue. Getting things in order with the kids. Getting clothes ready. Finding Sunday school materials and Bibles all ready for the morning. How many would say, I'll tell you what, the best fights our family's ever had have been in the car between our house and church. And now we can say best because, you know, it's okay. But at the time, oh, my goodness. Maybe this is a Saturday night. It cost me, I have to sacrifice on Saturday night. So this Sunday morning, this morning as you got up, did you say, God, I'm going to church. Please prepare my heart. It takes energy. Mm. There should not be anything amongst believers as passive worship observation. I mean, there should never be anything like sitting there and just kind of watching the worship parade go by. We must be involved and make an investment of our energy for this worship to happen. There is a cost to giving our best. You know, today I want to look and be able to look God in the face and say, God, I brought my A game today to worship. Again, that might be a Saturday night issue. Because, you know, if I plan to give my best in worship, I can't be up all night Saturday night. It's true at work. If i got to be at work at 8 o'clock, I can't be awake still at 3 o'clock in the morning the night before. Not if I'm going to bring my best. Now, all these things that I've said, we all know what I've said is true. Every once in a while, I just kind of swallow hard and say it. But I don't think I've said anything you don't already know. Worship must be total. Total. Whenever, wherever, whatever I'm doing must be worship. 
St. Paul, incredibly enough, in Colossians chapter 3, verse 17, says this, Whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Can, do you know what the meaning of the Greek word everything is? Everything. About 3 o'clock this afternoon, that one's going to hit you, and that'll be great. The French priest, Pierre Tillard de Chardin, said, We are not human beings on a spiritual journey. We are spiritual beings on a human journey. We're not human beings on a spiritual journey. We are spiritual beings on a human journey. Does that change the way you look at life? I believe it is true. You are a spiritual being. You might live 20, 30, 70, or you might even chase after Betty White and do 100 years. But you're, you will be a human being. But you will always be a spiritual being. We are to be all that God wants us to be, wherever we are, whenever we are there, and whatever we're doing. Finally, worship must be total, as I mentioned before, but worship must also be timely. Timely. So I wanted to grab this here. And this is my white post. This white post is 180 years old. And you know, if I paint this freshly painted white post 180 years ago and don't do anything to it, is that paint post still going to be a freshly painted white post today? You know the answer is no. You know, the answer is no. But you know, I'll tell you what. When Grandpa, we're actually really great-grandpa, great-great-grandpa, probably great-great-great-grandpa, 180 years. When Grandpa did this, he did it good. It's a good post. This is the post. Okay? The question is not whether this post is still good. It is whether it is still freshly painted white. So, if this is going to be somebody's going to have to paint it again. So in eight, uh, 180 years ago, 1842 actually, this post was planted, posted, and painted white. In 1936, there was another coat of paint put on it. There was another coat of paint put on it in 1997. There was another coat put on it in 2018. Can I tell you, I'm not just drawing those names, those dates out of the sky. Those are our dates. Florence Church was established in 1842. This is our 180th birthday, and that deserves a round of applause right there. 180 years. Oh, by the way, we're going to be celebrating this year, so just get ready. There are going to be some great parties as this year unfolds. 180 years. How fantastic is that? 1936. The little white cabin that was the church moved on to State Street and they built a church on State Street. 1997, they built a church on Old Toll Road. 2018, they <laughs> built a whole new extension. Now, let me tell you something. When great-great-great-grandpa when painted, paint, painted this post white to keep it nice, freshly painted white, he probably used some kind of lead-based paint. I don't know what he used. So be careful. Probably not good to mess with it. But about 1936, when they repainted it again, they probably used some kind of an oil paint. 1997, probably some kind of latex something or other to keep it freshly painted white. 2018, everybody put on their mask and <laughs> painted white, done. It's, it's not a question of whether this is a good post or not. The question is, is it still painted freshly white? This post is our worship. You know, I, I have no desire at all. Maybe see some pictures, but I have no desire at all to worship like it's 1842. I'm going to step on a couple of toes. I have no desire at all to worship like as though we did back on State Street. I have no desire at all to worship like we did when 1997 we moved into this incredible, fantastic facility. And can I say, I don't even want to worship like we did in 2018, and I arrived in 2018. This is a great post. 
great post. But if it is going to be a freshly painted white post, my question is, what is our worship going to be like in 2022? 2023, 2030. I want to make you a promise. And that promise is this. If you invite your friends, your family, your neighbors, your friends to come worship at Florence Church, I promise you, you won't be embarrassed. Because we have determined that we are going to give only our best to God. And we are going to hear again, come Let us worship and fall down and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. I'll even say this. If you come and you invite others to come, you, we together will experience, and I'm going to go ahead and say it, biblical worship. Let's pray together. Lord, take us, use us, help us. We want to be your people. Thank you for the gift of worship in our lives. Thank you that that gift has changed down through the years. Help us to be listening, watching, putting our hands on the pulse of the world around us. I'm just even right here in Boone County. And Lord, may we be vessels of worship in 2022 like never before. We love you and we thank you. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.